This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, so um, I'm going to call a meeting to order. Governor Baker's March 12 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law C30A paragraph 20 allows us to hold this virtual town meet council meeting. This is our first town council meeting using Zoom. We've used Teams for the previous two. And it is also our first virtual town council meeting where we have provided for public comment. And we'll have more about that later. Um, I will call upon each counselor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can be, hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. So let's start with um, Shalini Ball Milne. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. And I just want to add for the newer people that you don't have to press the mute button. You can just press and hold down your space bar. And as soon as you let go of it, your mic turns back off again. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer, present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. I am present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Present. And Sarah Schwartz is still not present. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the March 30, 2020 meeting to order. Um, and we are doing this meeting, as we mentioned, virtually, and the time is now about 6.35. This meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded, and there will be minutes of the meeting as normal. Counselors, only use the chat to convey technical questions or issues. To make a comment or ask a question, please click raise hand. Make sure you can all find raise hand at this point. And if technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, then actually Athena and Sean are monitoring that and they will actually make sure it's taken care of. You do not need to call and or text or send an email. Um, if it gets desperate somehow or another, I guess you could text me and I'll see if I can let them know. We're going to start with announcements. Uh, and let me just say that if we lose somebody, we will pause until we can get that person back on unless it becomes impossible and then we will have to go ahead with the meeting. So upcoming council, council meetings that are scheduled as present are both April 6th and April 13th at 6.30. They will be virtual. They will, will include Zoom, such as tonight, and they will be broadcast by Amherst Media. Uh, they will include public comment, which can be done by Zoom or phone, and the instructions are at the end of the agenda and on the screen at this time. We're also restarting our standing committee meetings. We had one today, which was OCA, and Zoom will be included for public comment at those as well. And you can either make public comment by Zoom or by phone. Those instructions will be included in all of those agendas. The first meeting is going to be on Monday, April 6th at 9.30, and that is the organizing meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Tuesday, April 7th at 2.30 at is the Finance Committee meeting. Wednesday, April 8th at 8.30 is the Community Resources Committee, and Wednesday, April 8th at 
is the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. Uh, we do have our joint special meetings of the Town Council and School Committee coming up to fill the School Committee vacancy. Uh, they will be by Zoom and with Amherst Media. And the first of those, and perhaps the only one, we don't know yet until the candidates have all filed their papers. Uh, the first one is on Tuesday the 14th at 6. If we need to, we will go on to Tuesday the 16th at 6. We'll discuss that later on. I want to call attention to the particular volunteers needed slide. So the Amherst Senior Center, which he joined us last week when Mary Beth was with us, mentioned that she got a particularly great response out of the announcement on the show or on the council meeting. And so um, please contact Donna Hancock at 413-259-3164. You can sign up on the website Town of Amherst Senior Center under Request Support Offer. And there is a website that's shown here, and we will make sure that this is posted with our meeting as well. Okay. So we're going to go on to general public comment. And I'd like you to put the instructions back up, Sean. So if you would like to make a comment, you need to, you're, you, if you're on the site, then you need to actually raise your hand. And by, and if you're not on the site and you're calling in by phone, then you need to press star nine. And that will allow us to see who would like to make public comment. Is there any public comment at this time? Okay, uh, Sean, are you, and uh, Athena, are you checking all that with me? Yes, I am. Okay, I see no public comment. In that case, we're going to go on with our uh, agenda. We have no proclamations at this time. We are going to go on to presentations and discussion. And the first actually will be Paul Bachelman because we're going to actually wait for the people from um, Cooley Dickinson Hospital to come in when they um, are, will come in at 7.15. So Paul, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, and can we get the sort of presentation? You to, Paul, you oh. need to turn your voice up a little bit. Okay. Voice up, can you hear me now? Is that any better or not? I hear you cl clearly. Okay, thank you. So, um, so amid the chaos that we have going on, um, we have a, before we start this update, we have a very important day coming up, which is April 1st, which is Wednesday and that's census day. Um, I'm hoping that everybody who's been watching or is on this um, Zoom chat um, has filled out their census form. If you haven't, please do it. It only takes a few minutes. Um, it's a very important thing for the town of Amherst because so much of our um, federal funds and state funds are dependent on how we do on the census. This will be a very challenging year. Uh, we had a really good team out uh, working the, um, to make sure everybody was going to be counted and then a lot of social networking and then uh, the sort of uh, social distancing is really blew a hole in that whole strategy. So we have to do other means of getting everyone to um, sign up for the census and we ask you to help us and you know all of our way well laid plans were shot um so do it now if you have tenants we ask you to make sure that you fill out or they fill out their forms anybody who's a tenant any student even if they're not they're not in amherst on this day are still considered residents of amherst because it's where you spend the majority of your time during the year um and if you are doing zoom cocktail parties it's a great conversation starter for any cocktail party that you might have Next slide. So, um, so this um, tonight we have the same kind of setup. So I'm going to give you a status report. Our public health update is just going to be a Q and A for any questions the counselors have for Julie Fetterman, uh, and then we have our the president and CEO, 
of uh, Coley Dickinson and the Director of Community Health and Government Relations. So next slide. So the um, status report is, these are, this is the same slide as you saw last week, nothing major new. Um, there was the new uh, 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 statement by the President of the United States say, noting that his uh, sort of advisors, advisory is going out to the end of April. Um, from our point of view, town staff, we're looking at this in terms of months, not days or weeks. We think this is gonna be a long-term um, new situation. Um, and, and that's how we're preparing our staff. That's how we're preparing our operations. Uh, while we know everybody's looking at May 1st, we're, I think that it's gonna be closer to June 1st. Um, it certainly won't be over by Easter. Um, and we are going to be adjusting and moving forward. So next slide. And um, there is a typo on the slide, um, first off. So if you, it's not 339,000 patients tested, it's 39,000. There's two threes in there, so you ignore that. Uh, but even this information is updated. As of today, there are 5,752 5, 5, total cases. Um, that's an up, up 797 from yesterday. There are almost 43,000, uh, I'm sorry, it, there's, there are 56 deaths, up from 48, and there's 43,000 patients tested so far. So they're making progress on the testing. Uh, cases are starting to go, continue to go up, as are the deaths. Next slide. Um, so the uh, two new things from the town of Amherst is that on, uh, as of today, I've asked as many employees as possible to work remotely. Um, we really need to keep our workforces separated. Our core team, which you will see later, is um, we will no longer be meeting together, which we had been because it's, we all know the value of being together as part of just for a better level of communication. And as members of the council mentioned earlier, you get to read who, where everybody is and you can see their faces. Um, and it's really important for team building. And um, we feel like the um, health of our core team is really important. And so we were, we're all working separately in separate locations uh, when we do our meetings from now on. As you know, we do these every morning uh, for one or two hours uh, and sometimes at night too, just to keep up to speed on things. The other thing that uh, we did in conjunction with the superintendent of schools, we closed off all of our playground equipment uh, and roped them off so they can't be used. We did that because we could not um, keep up and continue to sanitize the playground equipment we will maintain access to our plate, to our, to our parks and outdoor spaces because we think people need to recreate, but we will not, uh, we're gonna keep people, we're trying to keep people off of the playground equipment itself. Next slide. Um, so we're sort of, we're moving forward with trying to communicate with the public. Um, and so we have, First, a new website that is up and that's live and it will be becoming more and more populated with information. It's called AmherstCOVID19.org. And so you can go look at that now if you'd like. Um, it's, uh, will, more and more information will be updated. It's updated on a daily basis. Uh, we're also going to be doing two uh, one hour call-in events or call-in, text-in, um, chat-in, however we, we're gonna do it. These, we, we, these will be Zoom events that will be uh, 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 shared widely. So it's, um, we looked at Facebook Live, but felt that was, a, that was a, just a certain segment of our population. And we wanted to make sure anybody who had an internet connection could uh, be participating. So that's gonna be Thursday, April 2nd. We're gonna do two, one at 12 noon and one at 5 p.m. And on that, um, those events, there'll be, me as, as town manager, the superintendent of schools, Mike Morris, and our health director, Julie Fetterman. So this is this no presentation. It's just gonna be us answering any kind of questions that folks have, um, and we'll be there. We, we, we are ready to be there an hour and uh, see how that goes. Um, so, and the third thing that we'll be doing is uh, I'm going to continue my cup of joe, but we're gonna do it virtually. So I'll be at my kitchen counter and 
you'll be wherever you are and we can share a cup of coffee um, on Friday, April 10th uh, from 8 to 9.30. Next slide. So uh, this, we usually, every morning we start with a status report of how the, with, about the health of our um, firefighters, our police officers, our dispatchers, our DPW workers. And just so you know, again, we're, over the last week, we're in really good shape. Uh, we have a few people in quarantine uh, and that's not unusual for an organization this size. Uh, the, uh, we've added additional firefighters, moved up some folks from the student and call force. And so they're training so they're ready to go and fill in uh, the gaps if needed. Um, we have added a wastewater treatment plan officer, a, a treatment person. And then um, two things I want to mention, um, the uh, wastewater treatment plant, we have to dedicate a fair number of staff now to flushing the, the sewer mains because people are putting those disposable wipes and gloves and things down, uh, flushing them down the toilet. And they don't just go away, they get clogged uh, in our pipes and that causes sewer backups. And we're, we've got much work that we have to do. We have to have two crews going out for various projects next week. It's things we'd rather have them doing something else, but now they're fixing these kinds of uh, problems that are developing. So we, again, we always ask you the flushable wipes are not flushable. I, you know, don't flush wipes, flush twice. Uh, we need the revenue. Um, so um, the other thing was transfer station is uh, having modified their processes. And uh, they, they're basically, um, uh, created social distancing, trying to minimize the number of cars who are, that are on site um, and doing a pretty good job. We got a nice letter uh, this morning of someone congratulating us and thanking the staff at the transfer station for doing such a terrific job. Pretty soon you'll see road work starting. Um, we have been doing road work on East Hadley Road. We're getting work started at Groff Park. These are projects that can happen outside because it is they are socially distanced when they're doing the work. Um, the road, other road work that you'll see is on Southeast Street, Pelham Road, and, and Henry Street. These are projects that will come forward. Uh, they can't start until the um, uh, plants open so you can get the material. So the plants haven't opened yet because the weather hasn't been cooperative. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, I talked about we're moving pe more and more people into uh, uh, working remotely. Uh, next week, uh, we're, uh, we will be st starting to roll out our regular meetings uh, for all the other committees that have been, there's a lot of pent up demand. And so we wanna start working that through, starting with our judic adjudicatory uh, committees and other committees that have time schedules and things like that. Um, we're gonna manage that through the month of April because it takes, as you can see, a fair amount of IT support to make these things work. Uh, we're, it's a new technology for everybody and we want to make sure that the public isn't excluded so that we're having a, a product that we can make sure the public is included on. Um, so this week our staff are working on those committees and we'll, we'll get a schedule for the month of April so we can keep the, the work of the town moving because this is the way we're going to be doing business for uh, at least two months I think, probably longer. Um, and then I mentioned already the AmherstCOVID19.org uh, website and the other things. Um, so the one thing I want to say about Zoom is that uh, think of it as a meeting room and uh, if you want to have a meeting of your committee, you can't schedule a meeting of a committee, a public meet, meeting of a committee without scheduling a room. So in order to post a meeting at the town clerk's office, you're going to have to have a Zoom address and it can't be your own personal account because it has to be the one that the town is approving. Because, and so that it's got all the um, requirements, it has the recording capability and all that stuff. We really are gonna um, work very hard because we don't want committees setting up random meetings without them being posted properly. You wouldn't have a meeting in your living room of your committee, um, so you, because you have to post it, you have to use it in a public space that people are used to getting to. So that's the stuff that we're gonna be communicating to our board committees and chair, board and committee chairs. So next, okay, so we're going to go to the public health update. And I wonder if Julie is still around. You're, you're... I sure am, can you hear me? I'm on my phone. Yeah, you're gonna have to turn off your computer or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
So uh, we can go, go to the next slide. Um, So again, this is a reminder who our core team is, um, and Julie is the health director, uh, Tim Nelson is our EMS director, and of course, Fire Chief Scott Livingstone has been our, is, is our police chief, and he's always coordinating our dispatch units. Guilford is our DPW superintendent, Sonia, um, is going to, she's about to take her turn in the spotlight as we start to talk about finances coming forward, and that's what we expect to be doing next week for the council and uh, getting uh, the meetings of JCPC and Finance Committee uh, lined up as well. And Dave Zomek is the Assistant Town Manager. He does pretty much everything. Um, so um, just looking to see if Julie is available. And go to the next slide. Are you able to hear me in the meeting? That sounds really good, Julie. And so just to introduce Julie. So Julie is our Health Director. And Jen Brown is our public health nurse. Jen isn't with us, but I just wanted to make sure you knew who our, our team was in the health department. So um, I guess the question uh, for Lynn is if there are folks who have questions, we don't really have a presentation piece for this, but I want to make Julie available at every council meeting if there are questions. So if, as on the council side, if you have questions of Julie, please raise your hand. Julie, you provided us with very, very thorough updates and uh, continue to keep the website updated as well. Uh, at this point, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Okay. Is there anything specific you want to make sure we know about? No, there wasn't anything specific. I think that Paul and I just wanted you to know that I would be available throughout the call today so that if anything comes up throughout the course of the meeting, I would be available for questions. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Paul, is there anything more with the slides? Darcy, Darcy, I see Darcy's hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Darcy, please unmute, ask your question. I just and then um, again. wondered if you could give us any um, information about um, what, where w there might be local testing that's coming available? That's a great question, Darcy. I think that later on in the call, Jeff Harness and Joanne Marcusy from Cooley Dickinson Hospital, Hospital are gonna be addressing that. So I think that um, I should leave that question for them. Okay. So I, I can just jump in on that. So the town would not do any testing uh, if someone wanted to do a, a testing site in town, we we would coordinate with them and provide the facilities that they need to support that. But it's up to the private, you know, the hospitals to, with the medical professionals to provide that service. I have a question, but I don't know how to raise my hand. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Steve. I see your hand, but there is a thing at the very end. If you put participant up and then you're under panelists, which is us, and then you can uh, raise your hand. Um, I should know how to do it, but. Oh, here it is. Okay. Can I? Excellent. Okay, Steve, go ahead. Um, so this is a question that I had sent to Paul and I copied Julie, but we're starting to see, we live in an area not far from the university and after a week of quiet, after spring break, we've seen a really a flood of apparently students moving back into town. And there might be a number of reasons for that. One is tired of being with their parents somewhere else. And two is that they might be from an area that seems to have a curfew. Or three is who knows why. But with those students, we're also seeing an uptick in parties. And we're really concerned about that up for the obvious social contact reason but it just seems incredibly reckless for, you know, for that to be happening. And I was wondering if there's any action that the town could take to have a stricter limit than the state or, or, and I know that the police are not supposed to be, they really don't have authority to be breaking up these types of parties, but 
to me, it seems incredibly reckless to have um, this happening and putting us all at risk. Yeah, so I can take that, Julie. Um, that's a really good question. It's something that we did discuss with our group. Uh, the police chief sees his role and his, um, his force role in terms of um, educating the public. And so um, having, um, if, if there is a party or a group of more than 10 people, there, please report that and they will go and they will start to talk to the folks who are there, educate them about the dangers. His force is totally um, educated and understand the situation uh, and try to keep uh, parties and gatherings lower than, than 10. Um, that's what we think is the safe. Uh, we think the safe thing is to be home um, without going out to any other groups. Uh, but we know that that might not be realistic for some um, age groups. So again, anything over 10, uh, they'll, they'll, that's, the, that's the number we're working from. And he's happy to send his, uh, his police officers to have a conversation with folks, I guess is how I'd say it. Thank you. Okay, Shalini, you have your hand up. Please unmute and go ahead. So there seems to be uh, conflicting information about masks. And it would be really helpful to know who should be wearing it and what kind of mm -hmm. masks different people can wear and should wear. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. I'll take that question. This is Julie. Um, so yes, there have been some things going around by email about masks um, in the past few days. And uh, I want to reiterate that what we're following is the recommendation that comes from the Centers for Disease Con Control and the Department of Public Health, which is that no one is wearing a mask um, unless they've been instructed by a healthcare provider to put on a simple mask as they um, bring themselves to a doctor's office for potential testing, or if they've been instructed to wear one at home for some reason because their ability ability to isolate or quarantine at home is compromised a bit in terms of how many rooms they have in their house. So, and then the other people who wear masks are healthcare providers and first responders who are possibly going to be coming in contact with an active case. They then wear um, N95s, which people are becoming more familiar with. Those are the more, um, complex respirators that are used because healthcare workers and first responders, if they're dealing directly with a patient, they're coming in close contact with them. Does that answer your question? Shalini, uh, you're on mute. Oh, okay. Can, can you hear me? Am I unmuted now? Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we uh, wanted to know if that answered your question. Yes, uh, I had a follow-up question. Given that mm -hmm. the symptoms are not known till later, especially for, especially for some um, people, like let's say cashiers at grocery stores, oh, mm -hmm. would it make sense to ask them? Because if the symptoms are not showing, they're not being asked to wear it, but they have so much contact. So could we identify maybe populations that have more interaction and have them wear some kind of mask? What do you think? It's a good question, Shalini. And, and we talk about these things with the Department of Public Health on our, our bi-weekly calls now. Um, and the science is still showing us that there is this possibility that asymptomatic people could be um, transmitting the virus, but it doesn't look like they're going to be doing that through uh, You're breaking up, Julie. And we have the coughing and sneezing, so through your nose, too. So I think all of the grocery stores are taking very good care to have wipes and for there to be gloves and to make sure surfaces are clean because so many people are coming through there. But um, there's been no guidance to suggest that having um, any kind of store clerk wearing a mask is actually going to protect the public. Okay. Dorothy, you have a question. Please unmute. 
Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. This afternoon, I received a robo call from a skin doctor in town saying that people coming in for skin questions, nothing to do with any COVID-19 symptoms whatsoever, were to come in mm -hmm. with their own masks on and to understand that everybody in the doctor's office would be masked. And if you didn't, if that wasn't convenient, you could sit in your car and do, do it from the phone. They're trying to have, get people to take, uh, do virtual skin things with, with, by taking photos of it. So this had nothing to do with any flu symptoms. Uh, I think we're going to be masked. Um, so I know that the official position now is no, but I just, I personally mm -hmm. think it's coming in a few days. And if you go online, you can find the directions to make your own masks. And a lot of people are doing this. And if you, you know, these are not medical masks, they're not perfect. They don't, these are nothing that a medical person would wear if they had any other choice, um, maybe in colorful fabrics. But I think that we're going to be, need to be masked if we go outside my opinion well, certainly as with any type of of health really you're not coming through Oops. good sir i'm not coming through no now you are now i am okay um so uh Dorothy, thank you for that. I think if people feel more comfortable wearing a homemade mask, I, you know, I, we're not saying that people shouldn't do that. I just can't um, at this time say that I have science behind me that says that that is an action that we recommend people take. Um, we're paying close attention to this. If I, if I learn different, differently, of course, we would alert the community. Um, I do want to say that it's very important that people not waste what we call um, simple masks or surgical masks because those are really needed by healthcare providers um, to put on people who are potentially um, contagious to protect them in the um, when they're working with them. But um, yeah, so at this time, I I can't say that I know one way or the other if a recommendation is coming that people wear masks. Are there any other questions from the council? I believe, uh, Paul, that our guests from Cooley Dickinson have joined us. And why don't you go ahead and introduce them? Okay, so go to the next slide. And the next slide. So we're really privileged to have uh, Joanne Marcuse, who's here as the president and CEO of Cooley Dickinson, and Jeff Harness, who's the director of community health and government relations. These two folks have been working day and night, as you can imagine. I can't believe that they gave us the time to be part of our meeting tonight. So I really appreciate that, that they've done that. Um, and so there, we asked them to just do a, an update on what's going on with Cooley Dickinson. It's such an important facility and our whole part of the um, state. And uh, Joanne and Jeff are two of the, the top people there. So we really appreciate you being here. And Joanne, if you want to start off um, or and see what we had, I posed a few questions to you, the types of things that we I think most people are going to be asking. So sure. thanks for being here. Thank you. It's um, it, I'm, We're actually pleased to be here. We do see that one of our many important jobs right now is to communicate with the public to let you know both what we're doing and what uh, information we have about best practices, et cetera. So um, if I could just start with maybe three or four minutes and share some information with you, and then I'll ask Jeff to comment briefly on what we're doing with various community-based organizations and local uh, municipalities and elected officials, and then we are more than happy to take any questions. Um, so I wanna start with our staff and just say how incredible they are. You would be, you should be really proud and confident of the kinds of people who work at Cooley. They are working in extremely difficult situations and I have to say are doing it brilliantly. Um, not only doing everything clinically they can, but really being sensitive to how challenging this is for patients, particularly in patients who can't have visitors right now um, and trying to make up for that real loss. Um, so we, I thank them and I just want to be clear how proud I am of them. Um, we're also really grateful and um, about the kind of support we've gotten from everybody throughout our community, whether that's a donation of supplies, uh, financial support that people have given us, 
um, and also just the expressions of um, appreciation that the community puts up, whether it's signs that they post or things on our website or letters we get, and we share those with our staff, and it really means a lot during this time. I uh, also want to comment on how fortunate we are, and I always feel this, but particularly during this pandemic, uh, to be a part of Mass General, uh, which is also a part of Partners. We are getting tremendous support and resources, certainly incredibly information about best practice. These are people who are uh, world famous infectious disease physicians, uh, lots of policies, um, and we are in touch with them at least every day, if not more often. Also, we have an, I'd say, unprecedented amount of collaboration with the other hospitals in Western Mass. Uh, so Bay State and Holyoke and Mercy and Berkshire, uh, so that we can try to make sure that together we aren't duplicating efforts and that we're uh, sharing information and eventually resources when we need to, what we call, use our surge capacity. So if one hospital has room in an ICU and the other doesn't, we will quickly make sure that we uh, best use all of our capacity. I heard a lot of questions about testing and we certainly get those a lot. So let me share with you uh, the Cooley perspective on testing. It's still very limited uh, and it's a little complicated. People think, well, how hard can it be to do tests? There are actually a number of different uh, resources you need to be able to do a certain amount of testing. So uh, from the staff who can do the tests, who have to wear their personal protective equipment, so the special masks you heard about, to specific supplies you have to use when doing these tests, uh, to the what's called transport viral media, which is how you then take the test, put them in a thing, I'm not a clinician, so some kind of thing, and then it goes to the lab and the lab has to have capacity. So over the last few weeks, there's been variation each day on which of those different parts of the chain, if you will, are most limited. Um, the good news is we are now uh, definitely increasing the capacity on most days over what it was the day before. Uh, so we've done about almost 400 tests since this started. So in some ways you could say that's a lot, but when you think about the size of our entire community, that's obviously a very small part of it. Um, and so we have very strict criteria about who can get tested. You have to be referred by a primary care physician. You have to meet certain uh, categories of people who are at high risk. You absolutely have to be symptomatic. And even if you're symptomatic, if you have mild symptoms, uh, your doctor will likely tell you there is no value in your getting tested. As you know, we have no treatment right now. And in fact, you are just uh, putting yourself more at risk to come out for the testing and you're certainly putting others at risk. And so typically you'll be told to self-isolate at home um, and to be in touch with your doctor if things get worse. Um, so we do envision that over the next uh, weeks that the capacity will slowly start to increase and we will therefore relax our criteria. But we're always trying to make sure that with that limited resource, we're using it for the people who need it the most. Certainly inpatients are a top priority as are healthcare workers who are symptomatic so we can get them back on the job if they are not positive. Um, if you don't have a primary care physician, uh, we actually can get you linked up with one and they can do their, the introduction and the, um, uh, the care telephonically. So you just can call our, we have a special COVID community resource line we set up and you can call that, you can find it on our website and they'll link you up to a primary care physician. Um, so we have, as you probably know, uh, in recent weeks stopped all elective care uh, and that's both to save um, our supplies so that we have as much supplies as we can when the volume of COVID patients increases. Um, and we also uh, wanted to stop people coming in and having social distancing as much as we could. So in addition to elective surgeries and you know, some people were happy that they now had an excuse not to get their colonoscopy, but um, in fact, we also uh, have very little care coming to the uh, physician offices and out other outpatient practices. So in general, people are asked to call their physician. If it's a visit that can be deferred, like it was your annual physical, typically they'll uh, look to reschedule that. Otherwise, they're trying to do as much on the phone as possible uh, and then only limiting what people come in when they really need to be seen. Um, they do not ask that the patients coming in to be seen for a non-respiratory issue wear a mask. So that dermatology practice is not one of ours. 
Um, and then um, we uh, are also planning for what we know will come, which is a real surge in the volume. Right now we're relatively quiet, although getting busier in our ICU. Today we had 12 positive patients in the hospital with uh, several more who are, we're waiting for test results. Um, so, and that has grown each day. Um, but we are planning for how can we increase our capacity um, over the next few weeks. And we've already figured out how to about double both our ICU capacity and our med surge capacity. Um, I know someone's gonna ask me, is that enough? And I don't know. Um, nobody knows, right? We don't know whether this will be as bad as some of the countries where it's really hit or all the efforts around social distancing and hand hygiene and all the preparing will make the difference. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about what we're doing for our staff, uh, because as I said, they're an amazing resource and we need them and you need them in the weeks to come. So in addition to um, trying all we can to get them the supplies and equipment to keep themselves safe, which is a constant battle. We're watching our supplies every day um, and trying to make sure that we have at least a week's worth and hoping that the next shipment comes in. Um, we also have allowed as many employees as we can to work remotely. Um, and then other employees who are available uh, because let's say we've significantly reduced our physical therapy visits. Those uh, staff are available then to work elsewhere. And if there's really no work for them to do, uh, we actually have uh, offered people up to eight weeks of a wage security program. So if they go home because we don't have work for them to do, uh, they will continue to get paid for up to eight weeks as long as they remain available to come back in if and when we need them. Um, and then all of the uh, emotional and mental health support we can give them. We have 24 seven uh, employee assistance program and a myriad of different kinds of resources and videos and documents and materials to help them deal with what's such a difficult situation uh, for themselves and also for their family. Um, so I feel like before I uh, turn it over to Jeff, and I know you have heard this a million times, but I can't, I have to say it again, I can't tell you how important following the social distancing, the hand hygiene, the cleaning of uh, surfaces is. This is the way that we can make a difference here. And we're a little bit fortunate in being a little bit more rural than Boston. And I think it's uh, you know coming to us a little after them. So we started the social distancing um, at an earlier stage. And I think we should be able to be more successful at social distancing so we could hopefully avoid a surge that outstrips our capacity. Um, so what I'm saying is whatever level of care and diligence you were doing yesterday, double it tomorrow. And even things like, I just want to comment on the masks and you could say, well, it doesn't hurt to wear the homemade masks. You should know how suboptimal they are. We hope we never have to use them for our staff. But what worries me, and again, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a nurse. I just worry that people wearing these homemade masks are going to have a false sense of security and that they're going to stop social distancing. They're going to get too close to each other. They're going to think they can go out. And that is not a good idea. So, um, you know, it certainly doesn't hurt to have something covering you, but don't make that change anything you would do um, because it's the, the only way our community is really going to be able to get through this. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff and then we are both happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and hello, Town Council. I wanted to uh, just give you a brief snapshot of some of the ways that we're in regular communication with our nonprofit peers, uh, health and social service agencies. As everybody can imagine, people are concerned about getting their basic needs met. So access to food, housing, transportation, all of those things become uh, really, really magnified when, when uh, you don't have those services as available as you typically do. We also are thinking about people with mental health challenges and people who have a substance use disorder who need their uh, medication. So those are all things that we are in the midst of working through with our community partners at nonprofits and also with municipal um, organizations. So working with health department leaders like Julie Fetterman and Amherst and others, working with fire chiefs like Tim Nelson and Amherst and, and other communities, and uh, certainly uh, town manager Bachelman but also elected officials, whether mayors, um, local senators, 
and the representatives and to some extent our uh, federal um, senators and representatives as well to make sure that we're all staying informed, connected, trying to identify problems very, very early as they develop, trying to identify solutions very, very early as they become available. And um, I also want to uh, point out to people that there is a list of resources on Cooley Dickinson's website. So uh, folks that may be watching at home, um, if you are in need of resources, you can go to cooleydickinson.org. You'll see the COVID-19 page very quickly, and you will see a link um, and a boxed out information on the right that says COVID-19 community resources. So if you're in need of, of housing or, or whatnot, you can go to that website and look up, and we have as much of inf information there as we can. We were updating that regularly as new information comes in. And uh, Joanne mentioned the community call center number that's available on our website, but let me read it out also, just in case someone uh, uh, watching may not have access to the web. The telephone number is 888-554-4234. And uh, we'll be uh, announcing uh, some expanded hours tomorrow, but essentially it's daytime, seven days a week. And again, the number is 888-554-4234. So with that, I'll stop and um, turn it back over to you for questions and comments. First of all, thank you so much for taking your very valuable time in this middle of this crisis to join us and to allow the public to hear what uh, Cooley Dickinson is has been doing as we go through this crisis. I'd like to ask the council if you have questions at this time, please use the raise the hand function. Yes. Shalini, please unmute your mic and ask your question and then mute it again. Yes, uh, again, thank you so much for taking time to be here. Uh, the question I had was uh, in trying to figure out who, uh, who go goes out for testing. So what symptoms do we have? Or is that some, I mean, it's just like, I know that the health professionals will tell us and guide us through that process, but I'm sure it's on everyone's mind at what point do we get sent for testing? And secondly, you mentioned 400 p tests were done. Do you have a sense of what percentage of those came back positive? Thank you. Sure. Um, so I would encourage you, if you are worried and have any symptoms, you should call your primary care provider. That's what they're there for, and they will talk you through that. And obviously, it's a complicated it depends on who you are and what your other comorbidities are and your health status. So I wouldn't want to comment on that. Plus I'm not a doctor or a nurse, so that wouldn't be appropriate. So just call your primary care physician, they're there um, and they can help you through it. Um, so of the 388 tests of this morning that we had done, there were still almost 60, we were waiting results. Although again, that's better turnaround time, fewer that we were waiting than in the past. And there were 51 positive. Uh, Dorothy, Pam, you have your hand up. Could you please ask your question? Make sure you unmute. Um, this is a procedural question. On the chat bar, there are two questions from people, a very specific about, um, about meth addicts, whether they're at higher risk for succumbing to coronavirus, and somebody who tested positive and wants to know how I should be taking care of myself. So. The question is, how do those, is somebody answering those questions or do they get answered as part of our meeting or how do they get answered? Dorothy, thank you for drawing my attention to the chat bar. Um, the first question is, are meth addicts at higher risk for succumbing to the coronavirus? This is Julie. Would you like me to take that question? Sure. Okay. So you're at, the question is meth addicts. So um, I think that would speak to the fact that anyone who's a meth addict, their 
general overall health status is not going to be very good. So they're at more risk for more severe disease um, should they contract it. Thank you. Um, another question is if you test positive, what are you supposed to do to take care of yourself? Julie, probably that's for you as well. Sure. Um, so if you test positive, you will be given information by your healthcare provider. And then um, according to the town that you live in, so if you live in Amherst, a public health nurse will be calling you to review with you what you should do. The, the basic parameters are that you're in isolation and so you should be staying home and not leaving the house. You should have your own room to sleep in. You should not be sharing bed clothes or towels or dishes within it with anyone. If you have the ability to have your own bathroom to use, you should not share your bathroom. Um, you don't have to worry about cleaning it up specifically with disinfecting products because you're already ill. If you do have to share a bathroom with other people in your home, you want to have disinfecting supplies in that bathroom. And if you're well enough to clean up surfaces yourself in the bathroom, um, you stay home and isolated in, in your own room away from everyone else. You have someone deliver food to your door and you don't interact with them. You wait until they're gone to then go and get the food. So the idea is social distancing is, is a giant continuum. And so when you're in isolation, in isolation, you're at the far end of that continuum because you're actually actively contagious. Um, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Would you please ask your question? Thank you. Um, my question is, is for Joanne and Jeff, and it's not necessarily a question, but sort of a reaffirmation. I've been watching the and as many people probably have the statewide numbers and they split it, split it out by county. And at this point, Hampshire County is quite lucky in that we have beyond the islands, the lowest number of diagnosed cases. Um, but you know, you talked about our social distancing starting earlier, we're a little bit more rural. Should this, that number, I'm afraid that that number might give people a, a wrong sense of security and um, so you know what what would you say to that number is that because maybe we did self-isolate you know sort of or quarantine and stay home do do the stay home earlier to stop that curve or is it just because we're lagging behind everyone else so I don't think anyone really knows, but I would remind us that we're a relatively small county as well. When I've looked at the numbers, although we are certainly uh, less as a percentage than a place like Boston, I, I, I wouldn't say we're way behind other non-urban areas. Um, and it, we ha you know, we'll probably see increased numbers over the next week because as we start to have more testing capacity, so what we don't know is all the people out there who are positive but aren't getting tested because they don't meet this strict criteria. Um, so we should assume that there are many people in our community who has it, and that's why we encourage all so much social distancing. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I'm hoping that there'll be a test when things calm down to find out if you had it, because I know that many people have it with very few symptoms or even no symptoms. And I, I know it's not clear yet whether having it in that mild way is in fact like a vaccination, but I would really, I'm really interested in that. And do you know if there's any movement in that direction or any planning for that in the future? Well, there's definitely research being done into, uh, to do that. Yeah. That would be one more great thing to have in the future. Are there any other questions from the council? Yes. Uh, Paul, you have a question. <laughs> I do. Um, for Joanne, or maybe more for Jeff, what can the, the community do to help and support uh, Cooley Dickinson, your 
I have so much respect for the people who are working there and some of the things you see on TV, um, healthcare providers are just really the heroes in this, putting themselves in the middle of this, wading in. It's just kind of amazing. So for people at home or people uh, who want to support CDH, what would you say they can do um, that would best serve you without getting in the way in essence? Uh, Joanne, yeah, I'll say a few words first and then uh, maybe you'd like to add to it. Um, well, certainly if people would like to donate money, that's extremely valuable to us right now because uh, not only are, is our revenue uh, lower than typical because we are not currently doing elective procedures, but also our expenses are unpredictable right now because we're having to buy so much personal protective equipment and testing equipment. And so financial donations is extremely valuable to us. Uh, beyond that, on our website, I, I believe on our website, and I'm not sure I can quickly find it, but there is um, a list of, um, of things that we could use support for and a way to make donations. We have someone in our development department who is designated to handle donations and be the uh, interface on that. And uh, beyond that, I, I will say, and I, I think Joanne probably would, would like to echo, how much it means to us to have the community support behind us. You know, for the uh, for our colleagues on the front lines, our doctors, nurses, techs, who are going in uh, every day to work with patients directly, to know that the community is supporting them uh, really, really means a lot and is greatly appreciated and needed. So I would add to what Jeff said that, um, first of all, the donation of medical grade supplies, you might think that, well, who would have them? But for example, if you're a vet, turns out vets offices have those and other people in the research community. So um, just talking that up to see who have particularly uh, masks and gloves and things like that so we can have as uh, much on hand to protect our staff as possible. There are also people who have volunteered to do things like uh, help the healthcare workers to um, uh, get their gardening done or things like that. So anything you can do to help our staff is much appreciated. Um, but I also think back to what Jeff said at the uh, earlier, that there's so many um, people who are suffering right now in the community that we know are dealing with food insecurity. And so I think that uh, doing all you can to address all the social determinants of health that just make it more likely that these people are going to really suffer if they do get um, uh, the disease and also whatever can be done to uh, get people housing and other support during this time. And I would like to add one more thing now that I have the web page open and that is blood donations. Uh, that is uh, needed in our region all the time, but particularly uh, right now when people are more likely to stay at home, which we do want. However, uh, for people who feel healthy and, and feel inspired to give blood, there is um, a regional need yeah. for that. So I actually went yesterday um, to donate blood at Bay State. Um, sometimes people think we just compete. That's not true. Uh, and I have to say it was very well set up. It's not, you're not in a little trailer. You're in a big room where you can really be separated. Very well done to feel comfortable and confident that you're not at risk. Uh, and at least for me, it felt really good to be able to do that because I know how much we all need that blood. And Joanne, was that in their Holyoke facility? Yes. Yeah. So you don't even have to go all the way to Springfield. Thank you. Darcy, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to I also thank you for all of the work that you're doing um, and just wanted to make a comment about the, the idea that a, a, a testing not necessarily being valuable. Um, I, I live alone, so if I were afraid that I had it, I could see where it would be fine to just not go for testing. Um, um, but if you're living with others, just having the information that you're positive is extremely valu valuable information to the rest of your family unit. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry if I if I in any way imply that it wouldn't be valuable. Here, here's the harsh reality. We just don't have enough tests to test all the people we'd like to test. And so um, criteria are in order to use the limited supply we have of testing materials so that we can test the highest priority, 
but absolutely we are working hard to try to get more of those supplies uh, and those resources so we can gradually uh, loosen those criteria and test more people. Right, and the other reason that people, um, and I know you already know this, um, that people will want to know whether they have the immunity when at some point we can open our doors and go outside and do things. You know, we will want to have that information whether or not we, we had it or not. Um, so. so right now, there is, a, there is not a test to know if you had it and you got better and you're immune. So that, but hopefully they're working on creating that. But yes, there is so much more that needs to be done to, to expand the testing options and the testing capacity. And from what I understand from reading newspapers, and again, I'm not a clinician either, but from what I understand, um, even if you have had it, uh, does not immunity is not necessarily a given. Uh, there may be a period of time where you have immunity, but um, how long that's the case and how strong it is is not known at this time. Kathy Shane, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, when you talked about revenues being down, can you right now, both for Medicare and other health insurers, if you do virtual consults or if any of your doctors do them, um, rather than have people come in, can you get paid for those visits? Uh, yes. Um, the Well, the governor has said that uh, that the insurers are required to pass and Medicare and Medicaid have said they would. Until now, Massachusetts was actually behind most states in terms of having policies that support telemedicine. So if there's anything good that can come out of this, I'm hoping that at least we will start to really have telemedicine as an option uh, way past this pandemic. So yes, we, we believe we will get paid how much and if uh, we don't know. Uh, um, but we also know that certainly doesn't make up for the uh, loss of revenue for all the uh, physical therapy visits and surgery, elective surgeries that would have been done, but it will help. Thank you. And Dorothy Pam, you have a question. Yeah, it's, it's Dorothy, you need to unmute. Dorothy, you need to unmute. Is that it now? Can you yeah. hear me now? Okay. This is the same process question about uh, the chat text. Um, can public members, there was a public member who asked if he could unmute his microphone so he could ask a question. It was one of the people that uh, asked a question about uh, how to take care of oneself. I'm just, I'm just not, you know, I'm just not sure how this thing is working yet. Okay. Is the public allowed to do that or is that not allowed? We, I've asked them to type their questions uh, and we would then be able to carry, send them forward. We did not uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stand on this being a uh, public comment period. Right. Okay, so, so you've, typed, you've typed the request that they took. That's good, okay, I got it. Yes. All right. Uh, are there any counselors with additional questions? I'm looking for questions at this point. Maybe the best thing for us to do at this time would be to say, if people have additional questions, what would be the best way for them to get answers to those? Julie, okay. go ahead, Joanne, please. Oh, I think, so if they have questions for Cooley, if they call the uh, COVID community resource line, um, they either can hopefully give them an answer or be able to refer them to who can give them an answer. And Jeff, I think has that number, so he can repeat it, but you can also find it on our website. I'll say it one more time. It's 888-554-4234. Thank you. Um, if you don't have health insurance is, and you're feeling ill, how, how would you go about getting attention if you don't have a doctor 
and hospitals refuse you? Well, I'm not sure what hospital, we don't refuse care if somebody comes to our emergency department, we treat everybody regardless of ability to pay. And we can also help people get on the various insurance programs. Since, as you know, in Massachusetts, we have a lot more of the um, universal health care insurance than in most states. And if I could add one more thing, Joanne, um, someone without health insurance who is experiencing COVID symptoms, we would ask them to not come to the emergency department as their first step, unless they were clearly in an emergency situation. We would ask them to call that community call center number that I gave earlier and, uh, and await for instructions. And Jeff, would you repeat the phone number again so that if somebody has a question that they would like to call, you could- Yes, so again, it is on our website, kulidickinson.org, and the phone number is 888 -5 Five four four two three four. There's one question that asks whether or not a person's racial or ethnic background seems to make a difference. I can answer that. No, we have no evidence to show that. This is really about the fact that this disease is very highly communicable. Um, and then a person's own personal health status is really what is, is partly what is involved with how severely ill someone gets. But there are no racial, dif racial or ethnic dis differences. Okay. Any other questions from the council? Let me just check and see. Uh, yes, Dorothy, you have a question. Dorothy? I'm yeah, muting. Mute. Yes. Got it. Okay. I can really see how somebody who is scared really would like to talk to a person. Is there no place where with proper social distancing, someone who is concerned could go and talk to a person I mean, I know that when somebody's feeling anxious, it's very hard even to remember a number or to dial a phone number or whatever. And there's just a sense of maybe you're gonna be put off. So I, I'm, I'm really hoping there's some way that sometimes people could speak to a person in, in person with social distancing. Yeah, you would have to ask some of the outpatient mental health agencies how they're dealing with that. Um, and how they're making the decisions about who they see, who they serve telephonically versus in person. Okay, interesting. Yes, Dorothy, I'd like to add to that, that <clears throat> this is an incredibly difficult time for people um, and being isolated is, is just so hard. So there are many different phone numbers that people can call to get a warm voice on the other, other end of the line. Mm -hmm. Amherst residents can, if they're feeling incredibly isolated, call the health department at 259-3077, and we can talk people through their concerns and then also refer them to other lines where they can see people with um, counseling backgrounds. Um, I think, unfortunately, this is the nature of, of what's happening is that there really aren't places to go face to face. Mm. I can add to that if you do have a neighbor or you know someone in your community who may be um, isolated and lonely and, um, and you have concerns about them, I would encourage everyone to reach out and try to watch out for one another. Okay. Um, Alyssa, you have a question. I have a frustration. I realize we are all doing the very best we can here, but just as last time, we counselors are not supposed to be typing in the chat box unless we have a problem with technology. We are not supposed to be giving people contact information or references. This is not an informal conversation. This is not a radio call-in show. This is a town council legislative meeting. 
I believe that Paul told us about two call-in shows that are going to be held later this week. Perhaps we could leave that up on the screen so that some of our attendees could see that information and feel like they might be able to get their questions better answered. It's also clear that some of the questions we are getting are spam. They are not real questions. Kathy, you have a question. Uh, yes, I have. Am, am I okay? Am I on? Yes, yeah. you are. So I have two. Um, one, um, do you have an estimate or a guess of when you're going to have more testing capacity is the first part. And the second is, um, you know, what, what we saw that Germany was able to do that if um, someone who was infected and fairly serious, they were able to trace the contacts that people had had and at least alert them um, so that you could create a network around and potentially start isolating or quarantining? Are we able to do that either in Western Massachusetts or at all in Massachusetts? Those are the two questions. Julie, do you want to take the second one and then I'll answer the first? That the Absolutely. Contact tracing. Yeah, so I'll start with the second one, sure. So um, thank you for that question. Contact tracing is, um, is what we're all about with this because once that first case is identified, we immediately want to get that person into isolation, but just as quickly, we want to identify all the contacts that that person has had. So that is exactly what we do. And um, that process happens by interviewing the case and having long conversations with them about who they live with, what they've been doing, where they've been, um, this is something that public health nurses all across Massachusetts are always doing. We have over 60 um, reportable diseases in Massachusetts, and part of all of that work is interviewing people to find out, depending on the disease, what type of contact they had where. So we are well positioned as public health nurses to be doing this for COVID-19 cases, and it is an integral part of containing the spread. So you can be assured that every case in Massachusetts that is coming across as positive, um, nurses are being notified and are speaking with those, those people and then notifying the contacts and having the same deep kind of conversations with them that they have to have because then they have to go into quarantine. So to answer the, the question about testing capacity, I, I know how frustrating this is. I wish all of us had better answers. Um, I can tell you that no one in the whole state knows something. There's no secrets being kept. So we all are trying to struggle with the same issues. But I am reasonably confident that our testing capacity will continue to increase, albeit slowly, but that every week we'll be able to test more people per day than we were able to test a few days prior. Um, but at the same time, it's likely that the illness will spread. And so I'm not sure how quickly we'll be able to open up the criteria as more people get sick. And we prior make these difficult decisions about who to prioritize when you simply don't have enough resources to do as much as we wish we could do. Um, I wanna mention again that we do have these call-in events that are coming up on April 2nd at 12 noon and 5 p.m. And we also have the website, amherstcovid19.org, that you can go to for update information. That also includes how to get a hold of health, our health department, as well as other resources as well. Alyssa, is your hand still up or do you have another question? Yes, that's a defective part of Zoom. Yes, thank you for the reminder to, to remove that. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands up at this time. I wanna thank our special guests for this evening and uh, thank you so much for all the work you and our healthcare providers are doing for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. So we're going to go on to our Paul. Is there anything else in your report? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, again, let you know that next week we'll be talking about um, uh, 
we, we will again have a meeting next week, weekly update from the town manager and staff on what's going on on this event. Um, we'll also be start beginning the conversation with you about financial implications. You heard the um, our hospital executive talk about the impact on Coley Dickinson. We're not really focused directly on that, but it is something that's going to really impact our budget for this year and next fiscal year. So we want to start to have that conversation with the council as well. So that concludes my report. Okay. So Sean, would you please put the agenda back up? Okay. So we are actually almost through with the presentations and discussions but we're going on to the standing committee agendas. And that is a set of six slides, five slides, excuse me. And I've asked each of the committee, standing committee chairs to develop a table in which they identified, you might wanna to go to the slides, Sean. We're gonna start with community resources. So we asked them to identify upcoming items that were kind of on their agendas and needing to be attended to. Um, we asked them to decide if they, who they felt they were critical, whether they were time sensitive, or, or were they able to be delayed. And notes on the timing and then other notes as well. The very first one, if we could enlarge this please. just pausing to wait to see if we can have it enlarged. Okay, the very first one is the Community Resources Committee. Um, Mandy Jo Haneke is presently the chair of that committee. And Mandy Jo, do you wanna to speak to any of these particular items at this time? Sure, um, I'll, I'll speak briefly to all of them. The first one that I labeled critical would be the zoning bylaw revision on the vote quantum for site plan review. Um, that one was set to be reviewed by the planning board in at their last meeting that had to be canceled. Um, once they forward it to the town council, there will be statutory deadlines. I do not know the status of bills in the state on to whether those deadlines will be waived or not. So that one, if it gets forward and if they're ready to, we'll need to deal with. Um, master plan updates, they were, the planning board also had in its packet the, um, the land use section for master plan update revisions um, before that meeting was canceled. So that's gonna go forward. We'll have to discuss how quickly we wanna deal with that. I think some of that depends on where the planning board goes with that. And um, comprehensive housing policy, this one will probably get bit more delayed um, simply because it's gonna be hard to talk about on a Zoom meeting instead of in person. Um, and then the other two are things that when Lynn asked us to create this, what we thought might be coming in front of us. So I put them on there, um, but but I do believe they are delayable as I coined the word, um, depending on when they come to us and what those deadlines might be. Very quickly, are there any questions from the council about this committee? Again, this group will be meeting for the first time in a while on the 8th of April. Next slide. This is the Town Services and Outreach Committee. And while we have a number of things here, this slide was developed basically by Mandy Jo because these are things that were in the uh, queue at CRC that now get referred to the town services. This group will be meeting for its initial meeting and talking about both, um, first of all, electing a chair and a vice chair, and then talking about uh, the charge to the committee and looking at some of these agenda items. Uh, the, and some of them are critical into, uh, in terms of any additional appointments. I know the town manager is continuing to work on those. And in addition to that, uh, we have some that are time sensitive with regard to actual um, efforts that are going on. And some may be able to be delayed, frankly, because there's no students. And so parking isn't um, as much of a problem 
on Lincoln Ave as it was before. Um, so are there any questions on this particular agenda? Okay, then we're going to go on to the finance committee. Andy? Okay, I um, hope everybody hears me. I'm having somewhat of a choppy connection to hear you, so I hope that you're hearing me clearly. Um, what you see is uh, uh, what I put down for committee actions. It sort of gets at uh, the complexity of what is going on with finances for the town, which Paul alluded to in his uh, report where he said that we would be talking about it a little bit more next week. Uh, obviously, the Finance Committee is interested in the same issues and has been working on a number of the issues. So what I ended up doing was uh, developing an outline of the issues that are facing us as a, a community that the Finance Committee needs to understand and then try and see um, how they break out as far as the finance committee's work, which really involves scheduling, um, trying to figure out what the course of the process needs to be, uh, um, what's happening this year for FY20, and how we're working ahead for FY21, um, and those end up being the major issues. It's obvious that for FY20, we need to look at how um, expense projections are going to come up. What Paul was referring to is the expenses that are being incurred now and other uh, changes and revenue projections that we might have. Uh, what are the collection rates? Uh, what does it mean to waive uh, interest and penalties um, if uh, permitted to do so by state law if there are financial implications to it? What's happening to state aid? Aid, um, are we going to face the kind of um, cuts in state aid that were uh, previously faced in 2008 and 2009 when we went through the recession? Will the state be forced to consider doing that again? Those of us who lived through that period of time, it was a very difficult course. Then there are obviously other things like meals and lodging taxes and other kinds of income that are going to be affected. But a big part of our work is going to be planning for FY21 and setting up a process to do that and understand it's going to have to be revisited uh, because we know that um, revenue projections for next year are going to change tremendously. And what happened in uh, November and December when we uh, uh, received re uh, the re report at the financial planning meeting and then develop the uh, budget guidelines that were approved by uh, the council, we will have to be reviewed as to whether they're realistic for property tax, state aid, and other local revenue, and whether we have to um, adjust our spending um, guidance for the town manager. Uh, fortunately, we do have some flexibility about um, the process timeline, uh, some of which we've already acted on. One subject will come up uh, as an additional request later in this meeting. And uh, so the, uh, the, the committee is going to have to work very closely with um, Paul to figure that out. But in the end, when we come to an understanding of the amount of funds that are going to be available, what's going to happen is that it's up to the town manager to give a budget to the council for the council to refer to the finance committee and for the finance committee to review it. Two other things to quickly note are regional schools. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what I just said as far as what's happening to the town budget is also going to happen to the regional school budget. So we're going to have to have a uh, revisit some of those processes. And that's something that I've been uh, working on already. And uh, then in the, in that includes the assessment method. Uh, two other things, of course, are capital and uh, enterprise funds. And so we're trying to work all of those in. 
everything else is secondary. That is, I think, really what's most critical. Thanks, Andy. Um, I want to go on to GOL. Are there any questions of Andy at this time? Okay, then go on to GOL, George. Yeah, um, I think the chart speaks for itself. We um, don't have anything that's of any critical nature. I do want to quickly mention two items that are not on the chart, just so that the council is aware if they're not, that we have moved on the percent for art bylaw. And when the uh, president is ready, um, that could be brought to the council. And we are proposing to the council a very minor revision to the rules of procedure 10.8 related to liaisons. That's also ready for council action. Um, but, uh, and there's a report that goes with that when it finally does get to you. But as far as the chart goes, I think it's pretty clear that we have nothing on a critical nature. Um, we've got a number of, uh, a lot of work to do with bylaws, um, but um, that's where we're at. Thank you. Are there any questions of George at this time? Okay. Then we're going to go on to um, JCPC, Kathy. I'm just um, muting. I, I probably should have labeled this critical, but it's time sensitive also. Um, if you think of everything that Andy just said about the uncertainty of the current year budget, with, and even more uncertainty about the projections of what revenues we're gonna have for FY21, we have had a target of 10% of general revenues um, allocated for capital. And up until uh, this uh, stopping of everything in the economy happened, we were still working with that in terms of that's the total amount of money available. And the initial proposals from the libraries and schools came in, but we hadn't yet done the town proposals. We, Lynn, last time um, we met last Monday, had said that we would probably be meeting on April 8th. And I believe um, Paul and Sonia thought it would be better if we waited till the 15th, because we have to have some sense if we're talking about looking forward, how much total money we have to look at. Um, and that requires some notion of how much the operating budget, how much our schools are gonna need, how much town staff are gonna need, because capital, we may not be able to come anywhere near 10% and 10% of something that is shrinking in terms of revenues, in any case, will be a smaller number. So it's, we, we have a deadline and we will, we're gonna be talking about this later that the charter had required this to be done by May 1st, but if we move it to June 30th, we should by the second half of April and May have a better sense of the pot of money we're working with. And we're advisory, the Joint Capital Planning Committee is advisory to the town manager. So it would be what capital projects rise to the top as top priorities that we could be recommending that would be part of the total budget that comes back to the council. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and Evan, I know you gave us a report uh, that was filed late earlier this afternoon. Uh, and some of that may speak to the next chart, which is Oka, uh, but why don't you go ahead now and maybe we don't have to do the report later. Yeah, I'd actually like to just talk about it now and not do the report later. Uh, so in the table, which I'm just realizing in all my looking at this never caught that it should be outreach communications and appointments. Um, the critical thing is the ZBA appointments. Um, we, as I noted uh, in our last meeting and in the report, of the nine available seats on ZBA, currently only five are filled. Um, and so we see that as something critical. Uh, we're at a point now where we're ready to schedule an interview. We've adopted selection guidance. We've adopted uh, interview questions, both of which are attached to the report. Um, we've determined our interview protocol. And so the only thing that is left is to actually schedule the interviews. Uh, I am waiting on one uh, applicant to confirm a date before I can schedule the interviews. Um, but it will very likely be mid-April, potentially um, the evening of April 16th. Um, so if you're interested in attending those, obviously virtually, 
um, I would hold the evening of April 16th. You're already holding that for the school committee vacancy. Um, if this was to occur that date, it would be uh, potentially after that. Uh, so we're ready to move on the ZBA vacancy. Uh, and the one other thing that's important with regard to that is the idea that uh, we might not necessarily fill all four seats, um, but we do feel that there's some impetus to fill uh, at least one or two of them to give the body a little bit of uh, breathing room. The next thing after that um, is that all ZBA associates are, up, are on one year term, so they're all up for reappointment this year. Uh, so there's two of those. Um, and then there are three planning board members who are up for reappointment. Uh, and so once we finish the ZBA, uh, dealing with the ZBA vacancies, we're gonna have to deal with reappointments for planning board um, and also for ZBA associates. And so those are time sensitive um, and that they really should be done uh, before the terms expire on June 30th. And then the final thing is that OCA is working on uh, community activity forms and potential revisions to them. Um, that's time sensitive only in the sense that uh, OCA as an ad hoc committee sunsets at the end of June. And so uh, we have to move on those relatively quickly. But right now, the only thing that's on your, our immediate um, horizon is filling the ZBA vacancies. Kathy Shane, you have a question. Please unmute and ask your question. Uh, yes, Lynn, I'm not sure if, if I'm, these questions relate specifically to the report that we got about the ZBA appointments. Should I be, and the questionnaire, should I be asking those now or are they going to come back? Yes or no? I don't, I don't intend to give another committee report on this since it's in the packet. So now would be a good time. Okay, then I have I have two questions. One, I saw in the report, I read the, the questions, the interview questions that you had come up with. And I saw that you noted that you deleted um, one that you, or the type of question you'd ask when you did the planning board on asking the person to talk about any relevant experience or expertise that they would bring if they were appointed to this board. So I had I wondered why you had deleted that because I think it's useful. You have a, a final question of like, why would you be a good person on the board? But you know, what would you contribute? But I, I think a probe that goes more specifically to that notion of experience of expertise that um, just let people expand. So that's my first question. Then the second is I saw your note and you just mentioned now that you, you have enough applicants to say that you have an applicant pool, but you may not fill them all. Do you have a plan then to try to enrich the applicant pool on, for example, find some women to apply? Is that what, why you wouldn't try to fill them all now? And so reopen it to cast the search broader thinking we're in a, a critical time. So what's your thinking on a fill just some now and then go out and get more names? So those are the two questions. Okay, uh, so with regard to the first question, um, and this was a fairly lengthy conversation that we had this morning uh, looking at the interview questions, and there was a feeling as though um, the two things that we were really trying to get at from the applicants um, were, do they understand the role of the ZBA and do they have experience that would be relevant to that role? Um, and so that's why you have that first question about understanding the role. Um, and then the second question that we felt really got at uh, experience was the one about applying rules and regulations. Um, you know, the, the role of the ZBA is much narrower than that of the planning board and it's really an adjudic uh, adjudicatory body. And so there was a feeling that uh, the primary expertise or experience that we were looking for was some experience applying rules and regulations um, in, in multiple contexts. And so there was a feeling that between those two questions, uh, we really got a sense of what we were looking for. And then, of course, if they felt like there was something that they had that was an experience that wasn't covered, uh, they had the opportunity to offer that in the final two questions. Uh, but what we really wanted to get at was some experience um, objectively applying rules and regulations, um, because that, that, after all, is the role of the ZBA. And so there's a feeling that the, an additional question about what's your relevant expertise or experience uh, seemed a bit superfluous, given that the other questions should get to uh, what we're really looking for. With regard to your second question, um, which is now currently escaping me, uh, oh, 
it was about the the pool. Um, I don't think the decision, the the statement that we don't necessarily feel a need to fill all of the seats is necessarily directly related to the lack of diversity in the pool. Uh, certainly, we spent a lot of time trying to recruit recruit the pool we have. Um, that was articulated in the report uh, when we first po published the vacancy notice back in September. Um, when we returned to the pool in uh, January or February, uh, despite the vacancy notice having been up for months, uh, we had a pool of zero. And so then we started a little bit more proactively recruiting, um, as was described in the report, both through the town manager, um, looking at planning board people, and I think also just person to person. I personally asked a number of women that I thought would be good on the ZBA if they'd be interested. Uh, unfortunately, they all declined. One I, I thought was going to apply, but ended up deciding not to. Um, and so I don't think there's a feeling that we're not going to fill all the seats so that we can go out and try to recruit more aggressively. I think my point there is just that um, we don't necessarily feel that we need to fill all of the seats. Um, and so there's four seats, and I don't want people... I don't want to give the impression that they're going to be getting four names in a recommendation because you might just have one or two um, or three. And so uh, I'm not saying that we won't fill all of them. I'm saying that we don't feel as though we need to fill all of them if we don't find four people in the pool that we feel um, meet the, cri the, the guidance or criteria that we're really looking for, um, that the body can operate with just a few more of those seats filled um, and that we don't feel like we, it, we don't feel like we have to take what we can get, I guess, um, is part of that. And, and the other thing, because the other thing to consider is that um, this, this is a much more complicated puzzle than it was for the planning board. The planning board, we had three applicants, we had one vacancy. Uh, here we have several applicants, we technically have four vacancies, and there's this combination of associate and regular members. And so there's also some math to determine, uh, or some, you know, calculus, not in the literal sense of, uh, you know, do we want to move some associate members to regular member positions? Um, and so how we fill these things, there's really a lot of options before us. And so the point of that statement is just to show there's a lot of options and, and what might come forward might not be a clean, we're replacing these two regular members with these two people, and, okay? Hey, Glenn, can I just follow up on the, the experience question? I, what I'm curious about is even, a, since I know you don't do follow-up questions, I'll, I'll take myself as an example that I worked for a little over a decade with a labor union. If I knew, had some idea of a frame of reference of what experience you might think relevant, if I was prompted, um, we had to read contract rules all the time and decide whether employers had or hadn't complied. I might not know that rules and regulations were that broadly. If you asked me what experience I could bring in you know, trying to think of uh, working with a committee or how to do interpretation, I would bring in my union experience. So in interview experiences I've had, these kind of open-ended about experience that you think are relevant, people will come in and think of what do I have? Um, so it's not the expertise as much, but Great, you know, if they were a lawyer and they had been a mediator and an adjudicate, you know they've done this, but there will be a full range. So I'm, I, I'll just push a little bit on it, even to say, tell us more or something that gets people to talk, because not everyone does a good job selling their broader experience. And one thing to, of course, note is that the applicants will have these interview questions uh, at least two weeks in advance, and so they'll have time to sit and think with them. And so if they immediately see rules and regulations and they think, well, I'm not quite sure um, what experience I have that connects to that, they have the time to think of that. And so in your example, I would hope that that person would think, oh, well, my experience with contract rules or, or regulations uh, is relevant here, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, and so... The, our, our idea was actually to have slightly more focused questions due to the narrower uh, role of the body in question. Um, Mandy Jo, you have a question? Yes, um, Evan, you, you touched on it slightly, but my question related to the associate members and now that there are non-associate member openings, is that being considered and are they being brought in for an interview or is that just sort of another consideration without necessarily being interviewed, but part of that conversation as to whether the associate members may get bumped up to full members or not. 
So that's certainly going to be part of the conversation. Again, that's what makes this a much more difficult uh, puzzle than the um, than the planning board is we do have the option of moving associate members up to, to regular membership. Certainly the council voted to do that. Uh, or certainly uh, that was done uh, last spring when the ZBA immediately went to five members and some of the associate members had to be moved up. Um, I, I have a, an outstanding request to the town manager um, for some information on uh, how much, if uh, any, experience those uh, associate members have uh, being impaneled um, because technically they could have been serving for an associate member for a year and have never been called on and therefore would have as much experience as uh, any person who's applying now um, and also whether there is an interest or willingness among those ZBA members uh, to be moved up uh, and so I think uh, those will be questions that will need to be answered by that time and will be part of that conversation so uh, are they interested in moving up and have they actually been impaneled yet uh, would be important considerations before we make this decision. Uh, but no, associate members are not being brought in to be interviewed um, for this. Thank you. I'd like to move on from this particular agenda item and uh, we're moving on to our action items. Uh, the first item on the action is our consent agenda. And if you have looked at your motion sheet, it says the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed and uh, when I list them. And the request to remove an item for a consent agenda does not require a second. Um, the various items that appear on the consent agenda are um, 7B, the amendment to general bylaw 2.2. This is non-criminal disposition. We uh, had a first reading of this. We have posted it and we actually were going to wait until next week, but since we were meeting this week, we moved it up to this week. Is there any question about this item being on the consent agenda? Okay, the next item on the consent agenda actually is the item that requires us to suspend the town council rules of procedure 8.4 and we need to do this for agenda item 7c um, this is the extension of capital improvement plan deadline uh, under chap uh, the charter section 5.7c and that is related to the next one which is in fact the extension of the capital improvement plan deadline uh, charter section 5.7c Last week, we did a couple of extensions on other budget items. We did not do this one. And so this one basically is just bringing this in line with the rest of them. Is there any question on this one? Okay, seeing none. And the last one is the approval of the March 23rd, 2020 special council meeting minutes as presented. Is there any question on those? All right, then I'm going to look for a second to the following motion. To move the following items and be and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 7B, amendment to general bylaw 2.2, non, non criminal disposition. 7C, to suspend town council rules of procedure, rule 8.4 for agenda item 7C, extension of capital improvement plan deadline. Charter section 5.7C. Item 7.C is the extension of the capital improvement plan deadline. Charter section 5.7C. And item 10.A, approval of March 23rd, 2020 special council meeting uh, minutes as presented. Is there a second? Lynn? Yes, Darcy. Darcy. I, I've been trying to uh, remove A. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to remove A and take that up after we get done with this. Okay. Is there any other ones that we want to remove? Mandy Jo? I'm curious what she means by A because there's nothing labeled A. You mean 7B? Oh, B. B. Sorry. <laughs> B. 
7B. So the non-criminal disposition one? Yes. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Are there any others that we will want to remove? Okay, then the motion is as follows to move the following items and print of motions there under and approve those items as a single unit 7C, which is to suspend rule. It's to suspend um, 8.4 allows us to suspend the reading rule, the extension of capital improvement plan deadline, and then the approval of the March 23, 2020 special council minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Any questions? Okay, then I'm going to do a roll call vote starting with Brewer. Please unmute and say aye. Aye. Or nay, or abstain. Thank you. Uh, DeAngelis. Pat. Aye. Thank you. Dumont. Aye. Reesmer is an aye. Haneke? Aye. Um, Pam? Aye. Ross? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Shown? Aye. I think I heard that as an aye from Kathy. Aye. Uh, Schreiber? Aye. Steinberg? Aye. And Schwartz is absent, and so it is 12, 0, and 1. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Shalini. And you know what? Um, yes. So Shalini is an I. Thank you. So it's 12, 0, 0, and 1 absent. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to uh, then taking up separately the amendment to the general bylaw 2.2 non-discriminational, non-criminal disposition. Um, so this is to amend the bylaw, the general bylaw 2.2 violations, criminal complaint and non-criminal disposition by inserting the language underlined and deleting the language shown with strike through. Mandy Jo, you've been working on this one. Would you continue with the non- with what's in that particular item. Yes, sorry, I had to unmute everything and, and all. Um, this was is a follow up to the um, part I did for the Board of License Commissioners where we approved or consented to um, approved the regulations they had passed over the summer. Um, they would like to not have us to have to do that every single time because it's a little more efficient um, and it recognizes their authority. In order to do that, we actually have to change our bylaws. This is the proposal for that. It has been through GOL. I'll let George report on that. And the, the result of this bylaw passing would mean that uh, regulations passed by boards, not just the Board of Licensed Commissioners, but potentially the Board of Health or another board, um, that or department that is subject to a specific penalty for non-criminal disposition could be without waiting for our approval on an agenda to approve that regulation could be enforced non-criminally immediately. Um, George Ryan, you have a question. I have a question, but I'm ready to speak uh, on this matter related to GOL whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay, I just want to remind the uh, council that uh, GOL did meet on February 26 and did vote four to zero with one absent to declare um, this item to be clear, consistent and actionable. This is in the March 9th report from GOL. And also that we voted at the same time four to zero uh, to recommend that, that this be uh, passed for three reasons that I think echo some of what uh, uh, Mandy's been saying that basically it makes clear for the Board of License Commissioners uh, as to how its regulations can be enforced. So there's an element of clarity here. It improves actionability for the regulations themselves, making them enforceable by non-criminal disposition from the moment they're adopted. Um, and from the point of view of governance, 
it takes a load, I think, off the council so it doesn't have to be constantly uh, dealing with these matters. So um, we not only voted clear, consistent, actionable, but we also went further and uh, voted 4-0 with one absent to recommend it for those reasons. Dorothy Pam, you have a question? Hmm. So why, why was this law here in the first place? I don't, uh, truthfully, I have to admit, I find it very confusing. I don't really understand what it was supposed to do, who put it in there, why it doesn't work, and why we're changing it. That's, it's. Mandy Joe or uh, George, would you like to speak to that? Uh, I can try to speak to some of that. Um, I don't know why it was in there originally. It got, I, I don't know if it was in our bylaws before we moved them over with the bylaw review committee, so I can't speak to that. But when we adopted them after the bylaw review committee, it's in there. It does not have to be in there. Um, so I can't speak to the history as to why it was put in there. Mm -hmm. um, there are many cities and towns that do not have this requirement for a separate approval by the town council um, that just do it the way that essentially remove that clause that, that I have proposed removal of um, for the reasons George stated of it gives our regulatory authorities the authority to immediately enforce them non-criminally without us as a legislative body having to watch when they're instituting regulations, whether they have non-criminal disposition in them, that they would like to be able to enforce that way and then to get it on an agenda to make sure that it gets approved by us so that they can actually do that enforcement the way they would like to. Um, and also it's, it's just a little bit more efficient in that sense, both for us and for them. So I have a follow-up, um, does anybody, look at those changes that they have made that the different regulatory boards make because it it seems to kind of this would be this is looser this relieves something looser than the rest of the government is so that's that's why i'm kind of confused um i can understand why it would be annoying to do it okay but maybe somebody should look at changes that are made by the different boards i'm not saying us but somebody should look at it so I'll respond to that. The board has every right to enact a regulation. Um, and we, we can enact bylaws, but we cannot, we cannot enact regulations for them. If they choose to enact a regulation, they can enact that regulation. Um, that's their authority under the charter to do so. And so if we want them to do something some specific way, we have to enact a bylaw. If they want to do something, if they want to regulate for the Board of License Commissioners a license, they can enact a regulation to regulate that. And this is just saying when they do that, if they want to be able to issue fines, mm -hmm. they can do that without us having to approve that fine. Um, okay. But they have the ability to enact the regulation and issue criminal fines um potentially i think but also things like pulling of permits pulling of licenses uh things like that they can say well this is your consequence this is just giving them another way of enforcing that regulation without needing our approval to do it that way okay Dorothy, is that clear uh, i have a better idea of it um but the, i guess there's no rogue commissions I mean, nobody looks at what they do. What if they started issuing all kinds of big fines and everybody gets mad at the town council or the town manager? And we say, well, Lynn, hands Lynn. hold on. Yes. Can't seem to raise my hand, so I'm sorry. There okay. is, may I speak? Please. Uh, if we go back into article one of the original bylaws, you'll see that under 1.2 violations, criminal complaint, and non-criminal disposition, uh, section B, which is the non-criminal disposition, reads very much like what we have here uh, with uh, the corrections made for maths general law, et cetera. So this is not new to the bylaws per se. Article one was administrative provisions. Uh, we do not have it listed that way in the current bylaws. Pat was on the bylaw review committee. So Pat, thank you for going back to that. Is there any further question about this at this time? All right. Um, so Mindy Joe, would you make the motion? Yes. 
Um, so I move to amend general bylaw 2.2 violations, criminal complaint and non-criminal disposition by inserting the language underlined and deleting the language shown with strike through. Uh, do I need to read the whole thing? It was in our packet and it was posted. I don't think so. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Then we'll move to a roll call vote. And I'll try to remember to come back to the people at the beginning of the alphabet. DeAngelis, please unmute and uh, state your vote. Aye. DeMont? Yes. Reese Mersey, yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Aye. Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz is absent. Paul Milne? Please mute, unmute. Yes. Okay, thank you. And Alyssa Brewer? Aye. Okay. It is 12, zero, zero, and one absent. Okay. Um, we are now moving on to the school committee interview questions. And I've spent some time again with um, listening both to the school committee. I got various pieces of feedback from each of you. And I also um, spent about an hour and a half again with um, Allison McDonald uh, from the chair of the school committee. We deleted several questions and we now have it down to the fact that we'd probably be spending no more than about a half an hour with each candidate, uh, which at this point, given the number of candidates, it's reasonable. Let me mention that the candidate uh, applicant pool closes tomorrow and we will be posting the names of the applicants on Friday. Um, I also want to change one moment, one item on here. If we have difficulty technologically, uh, we will actually then have the candidates write down their answers and they must provide them to us less than two days later on April 16th, 2020 at two o'clock PM. And in that case, we would then have to meet at six o'clock on the 16th of April as in order to make a final decision. Um, given that we've been fairly successful tonight, I'm hoping we have no technological failures and that we will be able to go ahead with this meeting on April 14th at six o'clock. I don't wanna go through editing on this media. Is there, if there are questions, generally let's have them and if not, if you have any other questions about the questions, please send them to me. I see one hand raised and that's Alyssa Brewer. I realize things continue to unfold, but we are getting mixed messages about what's happening with the one or two nights. I realize we are not saying how many applicants we have and we could always get a ton more tomorrow by the deadline that could entirely happen. And that will have, you will then have to decide if we can do it in one night or two. We've done as many as eight in one night before. I don't know why we have to go to two, but you and I have had that conversation before. What I don't understand is what the definition of technological difficulties will be, what the threshold will be, because I don't know why we would need to give them a whole nother day to answer the questions in writing if they were prepared to answer them that night verbally, and then have to have a separate meeting on Thursday when as Evan indicated we could actually be having ZBA interviews that night. So I appreciate that we're trying to maintain flexibility, but at the same time, I don't understand under what conditions we would use that flexibility. All right, so let me explain. First of all, when a person's interviewing, they may not actually write out their full answer, but in fact, they may want to just make some notes. If we have technological difficulties, one is maybe they have to phone in because they can't come in by computer for some reason. Maybe we have a whole failure of the system that night. 
whatever the issue may be, we want to account for the possibility of technological difficulties. I don't anticipate them. I anticipate that we will be able to interview the candidates on the 14th. And depending on the number that we will know by the end of the day tomorrow, whether or not we will be able to also vote on the night of the 14th. We can change that. We're still two weeks, so over two weeks away. And at this point, Evan and I have also discussed the possibility that the ZBA interviews would probably not start until about 7.30 that night. Yes, Alyssa. Thank you very much for that clarification. And I realize it is somewhat fluid depending on the number that shows up tomorrow. And of course, technology doesn't always work as we expect. At the same time, I would suggest strongly that we go ahead and tell people they're going to need to be prepared to turn in their answers on, on Tuesday if they, we should consider having them be prepared to turn in their answers on Tuesday. That way, if their call drops out, et cetera, I, I'm just not comfortable with this option, but hopefully we won't need to execute it anyway, and it will all be a moot point. Okay. All right, so we left open the issue. Some people felt you needed to vote the questions. Other people said that you wanted to authorize the town council president to work with the Amherst School Committee chair to continue to revise the verbal and written interview questions. Um, which, what is the wish of the council? Could I have a motion? Dorothy Pam. Dorothy. Okay. I think it's it. Okay. I move that we authorize the town council president and the school board rep to um, do any more work on these if it needs to be done. They look fine. Is there a second? Second. Is there a further discussion? Then Joe Haneke. Yeah, I, I guess this is just procedural. Can we get that motion as the motion that's on the oh, motion sure. sheet? Yes. So I'll read the motion. It's to okay. authorize the town council president to work with the Amherst School Committee chair, continue to revise the verbal and or written interview questions as amended to be used to fill the, I'm sorry. Small thumbs. Uh, school committee vacancy under Amherst Home Rule char uh, Charter Section 4.1C. Yes. Dorothy, that's Dorothy moved the motion. Is there a second? I believe George. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Then I'm going to do a roll call vote. Um, we'll start this time with Darcy Dumont. Darcy. Can you hear me? Yep, now I can. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Uh, Grease Mersey, yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Shane? Yes. Driver? Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Swartz's absence. Ball Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. 12, zero, zero, and one absent. All right. Thank you. Um, there are no appointments at this time. Uh, I, are there anything additional that any of the committees want to report at this time? Okay, uh, we've approved the minutes. Paul, is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of reporting on the town at this point? Uh, no, thank you. I'm sorry? No. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, under town council comments that in a similar way to what you saw for the committees, I'm working on an analysis of the council agenda items that were kind of stacked up before we went into the present situation. And um, it continues to evolve. 
but we will try to bring that forward and sometime within the next meeting or two. Are there any future agenda items or questions? Uh, yes, Evan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to say, uh, so this was the first meeting we attempted public comment and I think uh, IT has been working overdrive to find a public comment format that would be workable. I think what we saw tonight showed that what we had planned for was not workable. Um, we had attendees who were able to utilize the chat function. Um, we had counselors who were responding to attendees in the chat. Uh, we had counselors who were reading the chat and then reading the chat out loud. And so it was kind of chaotic and messy. And so I'm just gonna request, and I think this is a request of the president and the vice president and the town manager and IT um, to take another look at public comment and to not schedule public comment again until we have that figured out um, because I don't want us to have another public comment situation that we did today. And I, I know we were aware of the potential for spammers to come in. I think we saw them come in. I think some people recognized it was happening and others did not and went along with it. Um, but I think that was really unfortunate. And so uh, what my request would be is to figure out how to deal with that and then I think that we actually need some type of written protocol to counselors about how to handle public comment. Cause I think we saw a lot of counselors uh, uh, not following any type of protocol clearly and doing some things that I think were really problematic. So thank you. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Alyssa. Thank you. Yes, I have an easier problem to solve, which is that we had just decided upon liaisons when this emergency descended upon us and I was, thinking that we probably had not had a chance to have the president reach out to all the various committees and boards and say, these are the people that have liaisons, these are the people who don't, this is what to expect. And it's really lucky we didn't do that because you know none of those things can be expected at this moment. But I assume that that'll show up on our chart as something that can reasonably be delayed in case anybody asks about it. And then my other thing, I suppose probably fit, but I wasn't there to wave my hand, um, under just committee reports in general. And that is that I know we're planning to start committee meetings next week, council committee meetings that is, and we have to do the reorganization that we've certainly gotten our rules and that we intended to do. And I would just ask that as we did with the most recent president and vice president of the council agenda, that those for the sake of optics, democracy, participation, we do not just have someone walk in and say, I'm taking nominations for chair. Okay, chair nominated second vote and be done with it because that looks to the public like we decided it outside the meeting. So I would hope that each of those meetings leaves a little time for the committees to say, oh, here's how the chairmanship worked for the last year for us. Now we've got some new members. And given that the charge has changed a little bit, maybe we might wanna do chair and vice chair split up differently, blah, blah, blah. Give people a few minutes at each of those meetings to decide that and then to go ahead and have the election, even though that means more of your time, Lynn, up front since you're there to run the elections. Actually, I think that's a terrific suggestion. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathy. Hi, I just want to weigh in on public comments. Um, I do think that we could have been trained a little bit more on Zoom, the same way we were on Teams. Um, I'm seeing that some people had already run through it, like the OCA group had already used Z Zoom. But I think it worked amazingly well, given that we had no training. And I agree, agree not to interact. I do wonder, um, having seen some of the verbatim comments, whether there's a screening tool where you can say, this one's just not from a real person, and I don't know what that question is. Um, you, you rephrased one very nicely, Lynn, <laughs> to get at um, a different kind of question. So I think giving people access to be able to send in something by a text or phone or during the public is is a good um, piece. You know, the alternative, just um, from my perspective, is that I have some pretty active residents in the district, in District 1. They can text me while we're having a meeting and say, I have a question. Could you answer the, ask this question for me? But that means that I'm 
looking over at a different device to try to get a question in. Um, and I don't mind doing that, but, but it is a way of getting questions asked more generally. So I would like to keep working on it, but not obliterate it. And I'm just wondering whether there's not a screening out. I, I know we did it when I did something like this internationally, where we had people from everywhere, the moderator could see the question and we were all instructed that the moderator would handle them and hand them, you know, up to the equivalent of you to call on them. So we just gave very strict instructions. So I'll stop there. Um, I did have a general question. Some of us volunteered to help be agenda setters and come, you know, I have on my calendar a meeting with you and Paul on a, the next few weeks. I'm assuming we're not doing that, but are you going to try to keep that process? So would we be in a virtual on a, the next agendas? Or are we trying to go to a new mode given what's going on? So that's a question on, on what I should do about my calendar. Okay, let me uh, say we did not try to do that in the last two or three weeks of chaos, uh, but we will get back to it. And uh, the one counselor that therefore did not get to participate because um, we were in this new mode, uh, we will reschedule. So um, Athena will inform you of when those are. They are virtual. We are doing agenda setting every week now. Uh, at the moment. So let me look at that schedule and make sure everybody's properly informed. Okay. Great. Great. That's perfect. Steve Shriver. Yeah. So um, echoing what's been said by many, I don't understand why we don't, or maybe there's a possibility of just disabling the chat function because I don't see a particular use for it other than to raise the hand, but we don't have a chat function when we meet face to face. So I think it's risky to have a chat function when we our meeting virtually. All right. Thank you. I we will be exploring this because this is an interesting experience. But please don't uh, throw out Zoom. I love Zoom. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I said please don't throw out Zoom with the bathwater. No, I won't. <laughs> Paul Bachelman, you have your hand yes. raised. Yes. So thank you. Um, so I've been talking with Sean, um, and so we. He will be lo looking at the options available under Zoom. There is, I'm sure it's a setting and we can funnel comments through Athena or however the chair, however the president, however you want to do that. So we'll work on that before your next meeting. Mandy Joe. Yeah, I was going to echo what Steve and Evan said. Um, we have to remember that we are a meeting as if we're in the town room, which means what happened with the questions from the what we would think the audience would never have happened at a meeting in the town room because they would never have been recognized and they wouldn't have been able to forward questions to us through a chat function and i think that's we're not in a small meeting conference we have to remember we're as if we're in the town room and that the protocols that happen in the town room should be happening here which means if the item is not supposed to have public comment then chat function comments from audience members should probably not be accepted either. Um, I know it's hard to think about that, um, but but that's this is a substitute for being in the town room. Okay. Darcy? Um, yeah. Wait a minute. Wait, I guess I'm open. Um, I, uh, on the issue of public comment, I actually think that um, you know, I really uh, prefer the the Zoom um, forum, and I I think that it is has the capability of really um, expanding the possibilities for public comment. If we don't want it in the chat, that's one thing, but um, we might want to have it both at the beginning and the end of a meeting or something like that. I'd like to be able to see the person who is speaking during public comment. And I find it yes. um, unfortunate that um, not that no one participated during the actual public comment today when um, this meeting was uh, chocked full of valuable information. And I can't imagine that there wouldn't be a lot of people that would be interested in in participating in the meeting. So I think that we we can get the word out 
a lot better than we have been about the fact that this is something that people can participate in and that we want them to. Um, so um, that's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Dorothy? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, yes. What, what I see is in public comment, people do not ask questions. Isn't that correct? Because I believe you say in public comment that you're not going to answer the public comment. So public comment, people make statements. Here, we had people asking questions, which has not been part of our format. However, I think one of the questions was real and the person gave their name. Uh, so with, when Paul does the, uh, the video chats, that is the time for questions. Uh, but so I think that this is not gonna work for public comment unless people make comments. So I don't know how that works. Are there any other comments at this point? Let me just say, I uh, totally agree that, uh, and I will be working with Paul and Sean and Athena to come up with a better way to continue public comment, uh, but not have the kind of situation that arose at one point tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, with regarding uh, liaisons, uh, we will get the notifications out. It is possible that some of those committees will start meeting in another couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, frankly, under the circumstances, they might like to have um, the council be there as a liaison. Um, but if you have other thoughts on that, please send me an email. Um, and Alyssa, I truly do appreciate as we approach the election of the chairs of and vice chairs of each of these that we have some discussion about the role of the chair and uh, we have some time with the new member and also look at the charge of the committee. Uh, is there any other comments from counselors at this time? Um, there are no topics um, under the 48 hour rule. We are not going into executive session and I am going to adjourn this meeting at 853.